Welcome back. Our last video, The Twitter Mystery, took us just over two hours south of my hometown of Port Pirie. This time we travelled two hours and 50 minutes south to the Adelaide suburb of Somerton Park. Back to my hometown of Port Pirie and the possibility of a connection to the Woomera Rocket Range, just under three hours north where between 1947 and 1980 it was operated by the Australian Government as a defence research and long-range weapons testing area. This is the intriguing unsolved mystery of the Somerton Man, the Tamam Shud Mystery. This case has everything, the possibility of Cold War spies, the question of murder versus suicide, a love triangle resulting in the undetermined paternity of a child, an uncracked code found in the back of a book, and the identity of a man still unknown 70 years later. This is Somerton Beach, just south of Glenelg. You're looking south, so Glenelg, just that way. Of course, in 1948, the beach was a very different place. Right here, there was a neat concrete retaining wall, and behind it, a promenade. At about a quarter past seven, on the last day of November, 1948, a local businessman and his wife came down here to Somerton Beach for a stroll. It was the last day of spring and had been very warm. As they were walking, they noticed the figure of a man leaning up against the sea wall. And although they weren't close enough to see his face, they saw him move his arm. They just assumed he was a drunk, trying to sleep it off. A little later, at around half past seven, a young man and his girlfriend came down to the beach. As they walked along the promenade, they saw a man lying on the sand. They could only see him from the waist down and thought he must have been asleep because he didn't seem worried by the mosquitoes that were round. Early the next morning, at about six o'clock, the businessman came down here to the beach again for a swim. He met one of his friends, and as they chatted, he noticed two men on horses near the steps to the beach. The man was dead, and the doctor who first examined the body said that he'd died during the night at about 2 a.m. There's nothing terribly unusual about finding a man dead in a public place like this, and the police assumed someone would soon come forward with a missing persons report, and the case would be closed. But that didn't happen. When the autopsy was carried out on the body, it soon became obvious that the man didn't die of natural causes. Police were contacted and Constable John Moss arrived on the scene. The man was lying in the sand across from the crippled children's home, which was on the corner of the Esplanade and Bickford Terrace. His head was resting against the sea wall, his legs extended and his feet crossed. He was well dressed in an expensive suit and tie, but had no identification or money on him. An unlit cigarette was behind his ear and a half-smoked butt on the right collar of his coat. A search of his pockets revealed an unused second-class rail ticket from Adelaide to Henley Beach, a bus ticket from the city that could not be proved to have been used, a narrow aluminium American comb, a half-empty packet of juicy fruit chewing gum, an army club cigarette packet containing seven cigarettes of a different brand, and a quarter full box of Bryant and May matches. The body was transferred to hospital, where it was determined by the state of rigor mortis that the man had died at approximately 2am that morning. 
Another witness came forward in 1959 and reported to the police that he and three others had seen a well-dressed man carrying another man on his shoulders along Somerton Beach the night before the body was found. A police report was made by Detective Don O'Doherty. A coroner's inquest into the death commenced a few days after the body was found but was adjourned until the 17th of June 1949. The investigating pathologist, John Burton Clayland, re-examined the body and made a number of discoveries. Clayland noted that the man's shoes were remarkably clean and appeared to have been polished, rather than being in the state expected of a man who had apparently been wandering around Glenelg all day. He added that this evidence fitted with the theory that the body might have been brought to Somerton Beach after the man's death accounting for the lack of evidence of vomiting and convulsions, which are two main effects of poison. According to the pathologist, the man was of British appearance and thought to be aged about 40 to 45. He was in top physical condition. He was 180 centimetres or 5 foot 11 inches tall, with grey eyes, fair to ginger coloured hair, slightly grey around the temples, with broad shoulders and a narrow waist, hands and nails that showed no signs of manual labour, big and little toes that met in a wedge shape, like those of a dancer or someone who wore boots with pointed toes, and pronounced high calf muscles like those of a ballet dancer. These can be dominant genetic traits, dystonia of the toes, and they are also a characteristic of many middle and long distance runners. He was dressed in a white shirt, a red, white and blue tie, brown trousers, socks and shoes, a brown knitted pullover and fashionable grey and brown double breasted jacket of reportedly American tailoring. All the labels on his clothes had been removed and he had no hat which was unusual for 1948. The body was clean shaven and carried no identification, which led police to believe he had committed suicide. His teeth did not match the dental records of any known living person. In addition to intense public interest in Australia during the late 1940s and early 1950s, the Tamam Shud case also attracted international attention. South Australian police consulted their counterparts overseas and distributed information about the dead man internationally in an effort to identify him. International circulation of a photograph of the man and details of his fingerprints yielded no positive identification. For example, in the United States, the FBI was unable to match the dead man's fingerprints with prints taken from files of domestic criminals. Scotland Yard was also asked to assist with the case, but could not offer any insights. The autopsy showed that the man's last meal was a pasty, eaten three to four hours before death, but tests failed to reveal any foreign substance in the body. The pathologist, Dr Dwyer, concluded, I am quite convinced the death could not have been natural. The poison, I suggest, was a barbiturate or a soluble hypnotic. Although poisoning remained a prime suspicion, the pasty was not believed to be the source of the poison. Other than that, the coroner was unable to reach a conclusion as to the man's identity or the cause of death. The body was then embalmed on the 10th of December 1948 and a plaster cast made of the head and torso. The police said this was the first time they knew that such action was needed. On the 14th of January 1949, staff at the Adelaide Railway Station discovered a brown suitcase with its label removed, which had been checked into the station cloakroom after 11am on the 30th of November 1948. It was believed that the suitcase was owned by the man found on the beach. In the case were a red check dressing gown, a size 7 red felt pair of slippers, four pairs of underpants, pyjamas, shaving items, 
a light brown pair of trousers with sand in the cuffs, an electrician's screwdriver, a table knife cut down into a short, sharp instrument, a pair of scissors with sharpened points, a small square of zinc thought to have been used as a protective sheath for the knife and scissors, and a stenciling brush as used by third officers on merchant ships for stenciling cargo. Also in the suitcase was a thread card of Barber brand orange waxed of an unusual type not available in Australia. It was the same as that thread used to repair the lining in the pocket of the trousers the dead man was wearing. All identification marks on the clothes had been removed, but police found the name T. Keen on a tie, Keen on a laundry bag, and Keen without the last E on a singlet, along with three dry cleaning marks. Police believe that whoever removed the clothing tags purposely left the Keen tags on the clothes, knowing Keen was not the dead man's name. What was unusual was that there were no spare socks found in the case and no correspondence, despite police finding pencils and unused letter stationery. A search concluded that there was no T. Keen missing in any English-speaking country and a nationwide circulation of the dry cleaning marks also proved fruitless. In fact, all that could be garnered from the suitcase was that the front gusset and feather stitching on a coat found in the case indicated it had been manufactured in the United States. The coat had not been imported, indicating the man had been to the United States or bought the coat from someone of similar size who had been. Detectives Lionel Lean and Len Brown were brought into the case about six weeks after the man's death and after police had realised that the circumstances surrounding the man's death were very unusual. Detective Brown is now a chief superintendent. Down there. Thank, you. Thank you, my boy. Now, that sack is actually the clothes that the, the dead body yes, had on her. This is the coat, the tie. This is the rest of the clothes that the, the deceased was wearing. I'll just put those over there as a matter of convenience. Now, this is the case that uh, we found in the Adelaide railway station, and uh, you'll notice on the end there was a, apparently had been a sticker there indicating uh, a traveller's, uh, the indication on the case. Uh, this is the case we found. It hadn't been used very much, had it? No, it looks, <coughs> it does appear to be new, reasonably new. Um, suggested itself to you at the time, uh, uh, but that's a, a special purpose for us. Okay. Yes, uh, from inquiries that we made at the School of Technology, um, and reference to textbooks, there's no doubt that this is a brush that's used for stenciling. He mo would most likely have been uh, a third officer on board a ship, uh, because at that time that was part of the third officer's duties, is to stencil the cargo. What else in the case do you think was evidence? Um, yes. The, the, the clothes that the deceased was wearing uh, had the name tags torn off. Uh, That's where you expect them. Uh, yes, in just the there. Yeah. Then, going to the case that we found in the railway refresh in the railway cloakroom, uh, for instance, there is one of the singlets, and that has the name tag torn off as well. All the labels are missing from the clothing on the body? Yes. And all the labels missing from the clothing? Not all the, not all the labels in there. Some of the labels, for instance, there is one shirt here, which is a palaco, and that uh, label had not been removed. That's a fairly new shirt. Uh, yeah. It doesn't look as if it's been washed much. No. The only thing is that we 
seeing that there was a tie with the name T. Keen on it, and if that was his name, well then, maybe that the clothing and the clothing in the case bore the name T. Keen, and this is the only reason that I can see for re removing it. But the clothes are all Australian, as far as can be seen. Do you think he was an Australian? No, uh, by his features, um, we were always under the impression that he was a European. But of course, the coat that he was wearing, this was examined by uh, one of Adelaide's uh, tailors at the time, and uh, he traced the origin of this coat back to America, American money, because of the way in which it was manufactured. Around the same time as the inquest, a tiny piece of rolled up paper with the words Tamam Shud printed on it was found in a fob pocket sewn within the dead man's trousers. Public library officials were called in to translate the text and identified it as a phrase meaning ended or finished, found on the last page of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. The paper's other side was blank. Police conducted an Australia-wide search to find a copy of the book that had a similar last page. A photograph of the scrap of paper was released to the press. Following a public appeal by police, the copy of the Rubaiyat from which the page had been torn was located. A man brought police in a 1941 edition of the Rubaiyat published in New Zealand. The man said he had not considered that the book might be connected to the case until he had seen an article in the previous day's newspaper. On the inside back cover, detectives identified indentations from handwriting. These included a telephone number belonging to a bank, an unidentified number, and a text that resembled an encrypted message. According to the statements by police, the book was found in the rear seat of the man's car at about the same time that the body of the unidentified man had been found. The man said he did not know how the book came to be there and assumed someone had thrown it into the car through an open window while it was parked. Detective Sergeant Lionel Lean, who led the initial investigation, often protected the privacy of witnesses in public statements by not releasing their names, and the man has not been officially identified. The theme of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam is that one should live life to the fullest and have no regrets when it ends. The poem's subject of romance added to the theory that the man had committed suicide by poison, although there was no other evidence to back that theory. The book was missing the words Tamam Shud on the last page and microscopic tests indicated that the piece of paper found on the dead man was from the torn page of the book. In the back were faint indentations representing five lines of text in capital letters. The second line had been struck out, a fact that is considered significant due to its similarities to the fourth line and the possibility that it represents an error in encryption. The letters were at first thought to be words in a foreign language before it was realised it was a code. Code experts were called in at the time to decipher the lines but were unsuccessful. In 1978, following a request from ABC TV journalist Stuart Littlemore, Department of Defence cryptographers analysed the handwritten text. The cryptographers reported that it would be impossible to provide a satisfactory answer. If the text was an encrypted message, its brevity meant that it had insufficient symbols from which a clear meaning could be extracted. And the text could also just be the meaningless product of a disturbed mind. An unlisted telephone number, also found in the back of the book, was traced to a nurse named Jessica Ellen Jo Thompson born Jessie Harkness in the Sydney suburb of Marrickville. She now lived in Mosley Street, Glenelg, only about 400 metres or 1,300 feet north of the location where the body was found. When she was interviewed by police, Thompson said that she did not know the dead man 
She said she did not know why the dead man would have her phone number and chose to visit her suburb on the night of his death. However, she also reported that at some time in late 1948, an unidentified man had attempted to visit her and asked a next door neighbour about her. Jerry Felt has stated that when he interviewed Thompson, he found that she was either being evasive or she just did not wish to talk about it. Felters believe Thompson knew the Somerton man's identity. Jessica Thompson requested that police not keep a permanent record of her name or release her details to third parties as it would be embarrassing and harmful to her reputation as a married woman and unfortunately police agreed. Her real name was considered important as the possibility exists that it may be the decryption key for the purported code. When she was shown the plaster cast bust of the dead man by Detective Sergeant Lean, Thompson said she could not identify the person. According to Lean, he described her reaction upon seeing the cast as completely taken aback, to the point of giving the appearance that she was about to faint. In an interview many years later, Paul Lawson, the technician who made the cast and was present when Thompson viewed it, noted that after looking at the bust, she immediately looked away and would not look at it again. When the book was mentioned, Thompson said that while she was working at the Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney during World War II, she had owned a copy of the Rubaiyat. In 1945, at the Clifton Gardens Hotel in Sydney, she had given it to an army lieutenant named Alf Boxall, who was serving at the time in the water transport section of the Royal Australian Engineers. Thompson told police that after the war ended, she had moved to Melbourne and married. She said she'd received a letter from Boxall and had replied, telling him that she was now married. Subsequent research suggests that her future husband, Prosper Thompson, was actually in the process of obtaining a divorce from his first wife in 1949 and that he did not marry Jessica until mid-1950. There is no evidence that Boxall had any contact with Harkness after 1945. As a result of their conversations with Thompson, police suspected that Boxall was the dead man. However, in July 1949, he was found in Sydney and the final page of his copy of the Rubaiyat was intact, with the words Tamam Shud still in place. Mr Boxall, what was the first you heard of all this mystery about the man on Sunken Beach? Well, very embarrassing business. I, uh, <coughs> I was in a pay parade around the bus depot when one uh, large policeman came up in a very loud voice commanded to know who I was, how I ever been in the army, how I ever been here, there and all the rest of it, and without any uh, warning, one of the uh, policemen said to me, did you hear about a body being found on the beach in Adelaide? And uh, I was quite candidly, I wasn't sure, because I wasn't particularly concerned about a body being found on the beach in Adelaide. What were they getting at? Did they think that the body was you, or that you were somehow responsible for the body? What, what, what do you think? Well, <clears throat> the, the first impression I received was that the gentleman from Adelaide was highly annoyed when, uh, after answering a few questions, they realised that I um, who I was, that uh, I was obviously the person uh, referred to by somebody in Adelaide, and. Uh, the fact that I was there and still alive and completely upset their apple cart and I was very displeased. During the war, Mr. Boxall was based near the Clifton Gardens Hotel in Sydney. He and some other service personnel were sometimes allowed into the hotel after the normal six o'clock closing time. And it was here that he met the young lady who said her name was Jestin. She was introduced to Alf Boxall by the girlfriend of a fellow officer. Jestin, who seemed to be a rather shy girl, said she worked as a nurse at the North Shore Hospital. He told her he was soon to go on active service, and at a second meeting,
she handed him a copy of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. Inside the front cover, she'd written an inscription. Number seven. Well, this is the, the verse that... Yes, that's, that's written right. here. Yes. And it's from verse seven here, and it says, Indeed, indeed, repent and softly, for I swore, but was I sober when I swore? And then, and then came spring, and rose in hand, my threadbare penitence, a piece of tore. Well, that's about being sober and being repentant, and... Yes. And you're all at the pub. Is it something to do with some... Have you had a heavy night or something? Oh, no, uh, it uh, couldn't possibly have been because uh, uh, these visits over there were uh, uh, so swift and sudden. I mean, they were never really arranged. Never really arranged. Uh, can you come? Can you come and so on? You'd s sneak down the stony steps and around the little bay and into the pub, and you know, I might have a couple of snorts and so forth, and, and away. Mr. Bothor, you had been working, hadn't you, in an intelligence unit before you met this young woman. Did you talk to her about that at all? No. Was it not done to speak about those things? Well, it was not done to, to speak about any army affairs. So she couldn't have known about your involvement with intelligence? Well, there's someone else, I'll... Because you see what I'm getting at, there, are, there is a theory, isn't there, about this whole affair, that the man on the beach was a spy of some kind. Mm. It's uh, <coughs> quite a melodramatic piece, isn't it? There has been persistent speculation that the dead man was a spy due to the circumstances and historical context of his death. One such theory concerns Alf Boxall, who was reportedly involved in intelligence work during and immediately after World War II. Boxall's army service record suggests that he served initially in the 4th Water Transport Company before being seconded to the North Australia Observer Unit, or NAOU, a special operations unit and that during his time with NAOU, Boxall rose rapidly in rank, being promoted from Lance Corporal to Lieutenant within three months. In November 2013, relatives of Jessica Thompson, aka Jeston, gave interviews to the television current affairs program, 60 Minutes. Kate Thompson, the daughter of Jessica and Prosper, said that her mother was the woman interviewed by the police and that her mother had told her she had lied to them. Jessica did know the identity of the Somerton man, and his identity was also known to a level higher than the police force. Her father had died in 1999, and her mother died in 2007. Kate Thompson suggested that her mother and the Somerton man may have been spies, noting that Jessica Thompson taught English to migrants was interested in communism and could speak fluent Russian, although she would not disclose to her daughter where she had learnt it or why. In 2011, an Adelaide woman contacted biological anthropologist Marseille Henneberg about an identification card of an H.C. Reynolds that she had found in her father's possessions. The card, a document issued in the United States to foreign seamen during World War I, was given to Henneberg in October 2011 for comparison of the ID photograph to that of the Somerton man. While Henneberg found anatomical similarities in features such as the nose, lips and eyes, he believed they were not as reliable as the close similarity of the ear. The ear shapes shared by both men were a very good match, although Henneberg also found what he called a unique identifier, a mole on the cheek that was the same shape and in the same position in both photographs. Together with the similarity of the ear characteristics, this mole in a forensic case would allow me to make a rare statement positively identifying the Somerton man, Henneberg said. The ID card, numbered 58757, was issued in the United States on the 28th of February 1918 to H.C. Reynolds, giving his nationality as British and age as 18. 
searches conducted by the US National Archives, the UK National Archives and the Australian War Memorial Research Centre have failed to find any records relating to H.C. Reynolds. Just to throw another spanner in the works, it has also been suggested that the Somerton man bears a striking resemblance to this man, Major Pavel Ivanovich Fedosimov, KGB. In the absence of any proven sighting or documentation that proves otherwise, this man could also well be the Somerton man. He was last seen in August 1948, boarding a ship bound for Russia. In 1970, attention was directed to a particular book, The Atom Spies, by a Senator Kavanagh. In the book, there is a page that describes the meeting of spy Harry Gold with a man that matched the description of the Somerton man. He was tall, he walked on the balls of his feet, and he was a spy master. The Port Pirie Connection at its peak, Port Pirie was exporting 3,000 tonnes of lead per shipment to the UK and US, plus an unknown amount of uranium. The Combined Development Agency, CDA, was established in 1948 by the governments of the United States and the United Kingdom to ensure adequate supplies of uranium for nuclear weapons development programs. In Australia, uranium ore was processed at the Port Pirie Uranium Treatment Plant, which was operated by the South Australian Government's Mines Department under contract to the CDA. There were elevated lead levels found in the sample of hair from the Somerton man. The most interesting quality of the lead trace is how the level changes over time. The trace maintains relatively constant level over the first half and then increases substantially over the second half. The tests show significantly elevated levels of lead in the man's hair which point to additional exposure during the last two weeks of his life. Port Pirie's major industry was, and still is, lead smelting. The town is situated on the main road from Adelaide to Port Augusta and eventually Woomera, where, since its establishment in 1947, the defence facilities have been variously known as the Anglo-Australian Long Range Weapons Establishment and then the Woomera Rocket Range between 1947 and 1980, when it was operated by the Australian Government as a defence research and long range weapons testing range. In July 1947, Jessica Harkness gave birth to her son Robin in Melbourne, at which point she was not married. Shortly afterwards, she moved to Adelaide and was listed in telephone directories under the surname of her future husband, Prosper Thompson. They may or may not have been cohabiting. Accounts of conversations between Jessica Thompson and police suggest that she told them she was married or recently married. There is no evidence that police knew in 1949 that she was not married to Prosper Thompson until 1950. In March 2009, a University of Adelaide team, led by Professor Derek Abbott, began an attempt to solve the case through cracking the code and proposing to exhume the body to test for DNA. Decryption of the code was started from scratch. It had been determined the letter frequency was considerably different from letters written down randomly. The format of the code also appeared to follow the quatrain format of the Rubaiyat, supporting the theory that the code was a one-time pad encryption algorithm. Copies of the Rubaiyat, as well as the Talmud and Bible, were being compared to the code, using computers to get a statistical base for letter frequencies. However, the code's short length meant the investigators would require the exact edition of the book used. With the original copy lost in the 1960s, researchers have been looking for a Fitzgerald edition without success. Marge Henneberg, 
Professor of Anatomy at the University of Adelaide, examined images of the summiter man's ears and found that his simba, the upper ear hollow, is larger than his cavum, the lower ear hollow, a feature possessed by only 1-2% to of the Caucasian population. In May 2009, Derek Abbott consulted with dental experts who concluded that the Summerton man had hypodontia, a rare genetic disorder of both lateral incisors, a feature present in only 2% of the general population. In June 2010, Abbott obtained a photograph of Jessica Thompson's eldest son, Robin, which clearly showed that he, like the unknown man, had not only a larger simba than cavum, but also hypodontia. The chance that this was a coincidence has been estimated as between 1 in 10 million and 1 in 20 million. It's also interesting to note that Robin Thompson became a ballet dancer, touring the world with fellow dancer and wife, Roma Egan. Professor Abbott believes an exhumation and a DNA test could link the Summerton man to a short list of surnames, which along with the existing clues to the man's identity would be the final piece of the puzzle. However, in October 2011, Attorney General John Rao refused permission to exhume the body, stating there needs to be public interest reasons that go well beyond curiosity or broad scientific interest. In March 2009, Robin Thompson passed away. His widow, Roma Egan, and their daughter, Rachel, also appeared on 60 Minutes, suggesting that the Summerton man was Robin's father, and therefore Rachel's grandfather. The Egans reported lodging a new application with the Attorney General of South Australia, John Rao, to have the Summerton man's body exhumed and DNA tested. Derek Abbott also subsequently wrote to Rao in support of the Egans, saying that exhumation of DNA testing would be consistent with federal government policy of identifying soldiers in war groves to bring closure to their families. Kate Thompson, Robin's sister, opposed the exhumation as being disrespectful to her brother. In a twist of fate usually reserved for Hollywood movies, Professor Derek Abbott met and married Rachel Egan, making him Robin Thompson's son-in-law and possibly the grandson-in-law of the Summerton man, the man he had been studying since 2009. In December 2017, Abbott announced three excellent hairs at the right development stage for extracting DNA had been found on the plaster cast of the corpse and had been submitted for analysis to the Australian Centre for Ancient DNA at the University of Adelaide. Processing the results would reportedly take up to a year. In February 2018, the University of Adelaide team got the Summerton man's whole mitochondrial profile from the sample of his hair. They found his mother belongs to the H4A1A1A haplogroup, which is possessed by only 1% of Europeans. A new submission to Attorney General John Rao, requesting permission for exhumation, will this time include a 7,000 signature strong petition demonstrating public support and will have the backing of some respected public figures, including a former Attorney General and Labor Elder Statesman, Chris Sumner, who has advised Abbott in the preparation of the submission. In my view, it is in the public interest for the exhumation to go ahead, Sumner says. It is still technically a cold case that was never actually solved and it would be assisting police at least to close the case. The founder of the Adelaide Festival of Ideas, Greg Mackey, is also keen to see it resolved for the sake of the man's potential descendants, as is the chair of the South Australian Museum, Jane Lomax-Smith, a pathologist, who says the case carries considerable public interest.
The exhumation would be at no public cost. The funeral home that carried out the burial in 1948 is so fascinated by the case that it will do the disinterment and reburial for free. Bizarrely, one of the key people whose support could help or hinder the new bid for exhumation has nothing at all to do with the man or the case. Back in 1949, a hat was passed around among bookmakers who drank at the Elephant and Castle across the road from the West Terrace Cemetery to save the man from a pauper's funeral. As a result, the name on the burial licence was the SA Grandstand Bookmakers Association. In more recent times, the now SA Bookmakers League was contacted when the lease was due to expire and paid to renew it. The funeral was such a simple affair that the advertiser newspaper's crime reporter, Bob Whittington, and the owner of the Elephant and Castle Hotel were called in as pallbearers. No one knew who the man was and there was no one to grieve. I will add the link to Professor Derek Abbott in the description below for anyone who may like to follow the updates. I'll also add the link to Foxglove 48 YouTube channel where you can watch the full three-part video of the ABC's Inside Edition, The Summerton Beach Mystery. So, that is the story. A mystery that has fascinated people around the world for 70 years. I'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions. Drop a comment below and let me know what you think. Was the Summerton Man and possibly Jessica, a.k.a. Justin, Cold War Russian spies? Did he poison himself? Was he murdered? Or was it in fact a simple case of death by natural causes? Had he come to Adelaide to find the woman he loved, only to discover that she was about to marry someone else? Was he Robin Thompson's father? And if so, did he know? Is the still uncracked code in fact a code or is there a simple explanation for the letters? And probably much more importantly, now that so many years have passed, should the body be exhumed for answers or should the unknown man be allowed to rest in peace with his secrets? If you know of any further details that haven't been covered in this video, I'd love you to leave them in the comments below. Thanks for watching.